Well, good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Healthier Communities and Older People Overview and Scrutiny Panel. Item one is apologies for absence. Are there any apologies? Diane Griffin. Okay, and Councillor Janice Howard and Una Moulton, Councillor Moulton is substituting for her, for those of you that didn't hear that. Um, item two is declarations of pecuniary interest. Are there any declarations? No, good. Item three are the minutes of the previous meeting. Can I apologize that these weren't included in the papers dispatched, but I believe members have now had a copy um, so can we uh, agree the minutes? Okay, item four is the impact of COVID-19 in Merton. Um, and there is a presentation. Who's taking the lead on that? Okay. Barry, you there? Yes, I am. Thank you, Councillor. So um, my name is Barry Clauser. I'm from the Merton Council Public Health Team, um, and I'm going to take you through the current situation report as we are within COVID uh, at the moment within Merton. There's a huge amount of detail and information and data within the slides, so I'll give you a brief overview uh, of the, the, the key points within the slides. Um, current position for COVID-19 within Merton is that we are hovering. We are hovering. We seem to be a little bit stuck. So our seven day rate is now hovering between to about 250 and 300 cases per 100,000 residents. So what that means in real numbers, in real infections is around 70 to 80 infections per day within the borough. And these infections are really being driven by the Delta variant, which, as we know, is far more transmissible than the Alpha and other variants. Um, but what I can say is that those infection levels uh, are no significantly different to our Southwest London colleagues and wider across London. And I'll show you a few more slides uh, later in the deck. Um, but the, the important point to say is that we are now hovering at around that 250 point, um, and this is a little bit higher than we hope to be. So we don't want to get stuck here. And clearly, as we know, the holiday period is now coming to an end. People are now going to be returning to work. Schools are now going to start to reopen. And so there's going to be more mixing. And so it's that real note of caution um, because we can see what's happened in Scotland over the last few weeks, which a few weeks after the schools opened and people returned back to work, they had a sharp increase in their infections. So really important that we take those promotion of stay safe messages really to heart and we work with as many people uh, in, uh, in the room uh, and in the community to get those messages out. This slide shows the, the numbers of infections, so our seven day rate. And you can see in the middle of the screen, that peak of that third wave, the infections. And I think it's fair to say that that wasn't as high as we thought it might have been, but it was still considerable. And again, you can see on the right hand side of that slide, so we are the black line through the middle of that, that we're hovering around that 200 and uh, 250 to 300 per 100,000. And you can see we're very similar position to the rest of our colleagues in Southwest London. Again, this shows us the differences across London. So it's kind of our heat map. Um, and what you can see there is that in both uh, the, the top left um, and the, the bottom left, uh, that we are no dissimilar to colleagues across London on both testing rates and new infections. So again, that, that's, uh, it, it's a very similar position across, across London. These are our NHS indicators, and clearly I know that we're joined by our uh, NHS colleagues. And what we can see there is that there has been a slight increase in the number of inpatients, the number of people in intensive care, um, but these are nowhere near the numbers that we saw previously in the pandemic. And again, uh, that is due to the, that success of that vaccination program. Um, but again, that note of caution is going to be really important for us. Um, and that watching brief as people start to mix again when they return to work and the schools start reopening. 
um, quite a complex slide, but if I start with the top left, um, what this shows us is the rolling rate of cases in the east of the borough compared to the west. Uh, and what we can see is they're, 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 they've crossed each other a number of times throughout the pandemic. Uh, and what we can see, there are higher cases in the east, but at this stage, uh, as of the most recent reporting week, they are very similar case rates uh, across the borough. So again, this is affecting all of the borough right now. Um, top right, uh, it shows us the number of rates by age group in a really important slide. And what we can see is that orange line across the top is that age group 16 to 29 years of age, which are driving most of those new infections uh, in Merton and across London. But what you can see is that trend going down, which is again reflected by the, the number of people in that age group that have now been uh, had one or two doses of their, their vaccine. So that's a really positive story that we can see and we will continue to track that as we go forward. This is again lots of information, lots of data on this, um, but what this is showing us, it's the lateral flow tests. These are those fast asymptomatic tests that we encourage people to take part in twice a week. And what we can see there is that there were, in the recent reporting period, there are about 10,000 LFTs taken place uh, within Merton Borough. Uh, and that's, that's dropped from a height of about 25,000 when the schools were doing regular testing and clearly people were at work. Um, so we're fully expecting that to ramp back up to, to higher figures. Um, and the important thing to note about lateral flow tests is that you can see there on that third bullet point that of those 10,000 tests in this, in this week's test, 152 of them were positive. So that means 152 people didn't know that they had COVID, they were asymptomatic, and so they were potentially going to work, going to see friends, going to see family and colleagues, and shed, shedding the virus, uh, and they were infectious at that stage. So we would strongly encourage um, everyone to take part in this regular asymptomatic testing programme on a twice a week basis. And really, really importantly, to also submit results, even if it's negative, because again, that helps us really understand what the true positivity rate is within, within the borough and across the country. This slide um, shows us the number of outbreaks uh, that we have, confirmed outbreaks right now, uh, and they are very small numbers. We have two in CY pits, sorry, children and young people settings, and one in a homeless uh, accommodation. And again, this is perhaps a quieter period for some of these settings, and so that's natural to see. But I think it also reflects the, the prevention approach. We're working really closely with a number of the, all of these settings. You know, we have regular contact, whether it's once or twice a week, with them to work with adult social care colleagues for care homes and CYP, working with our schools and education setting going forward. So again, it reflects the our ability to prevent outbreaks uh, and the importance of the vaccination program again. Um, this is a very sad slide, uh, and I think many of you will have seen this before. What this shows us is the number of deaths of Merton residents um, from COVID-19. And what we can see is that there are 490 of our residents that have passed away through COVID uh, on, the, on that, the reasons. Um, and we can see those two peaks, those two waves where there were significant increases in the number of deaths. But what we didn't see on the right hand side of that is another wave increasing as part of that third wave, again, reflecting the success of the vaccines which are aimed at reducing severe COVID-19. Um, last two slides, um, and this is the vaccination programme. So again, I know that our NHS colleagues are here and they're working incredibly hard uh, and they've partnered with faith settings, voluntary community sector organisations, partnerships, and done a significant amount of outreach. There's a number of different pop-up sessions across the borough for people to choose to take part and a significant number of webinars where people that might have questions, uh, they can ask those questions to clinicians uh, to get them answered so that they're hoping they can make that that informed judgment to get the vaccination. Uh, essentially, if we look at the bottom left, what this is showing us for the over 50s um, is that about 81.3% of our residents over 50 have now had the first dose of the vaccine, and that's slightly less when we start looking at BAME communities within Merton. Um, and again, that's, as you can see on that graph, we're kind of middle of the pack there that we're doing slightly better than some of the boroughs in South West London, but perhaps not as, as much as um, sort of Kingston uh, and Richmond have achieved. And again, 
again, the request from ourselves, if you have opportunities to help us engage with communities, with groups, newsletters, whether you have webinars that we can align with and we can attend, we'd be delighted to attend those sorts of webinars to increase the uptake of that vaccination program, which is considerably uh, the best thing that we can do right now to prevent COVID uh, within the borough. And we know that booster jabs are coming forward too. Last slide, uh, I'm gonna point you to the bottom line on the left-hand side. And this is the current position within Merton. So what you can see there is 115,000 of our residents have been fully vaccinated at this time, but there are still 56,000 of our residents that are unvaccinated. So we're working incredibly hard uh, to, to engage those groups to deliver in a range of different settings. And again, colleagues uh, and partners support and advice and guidance to uh, reach uh, those people would be gratefully received. And so I will stop there and hand back to the chair. Thank you, Barry. Um, are there any questions from members? Pauline, I think you're all right. She's going to. It's all right. You okay? Any questions? None? Okay, well, one of the questions, uh, sorry, I was jumping up and down, Barry, whilst you were presenting, because it was breaking my neck trying to see the, the big screen, but you were giving figures for uh, proportion of the population with the first jabs. Do we have any data about the proportion that have had two jabs? Or did I miss that? Yeah, um, thank you, Councillor. Really good question. And just to be clear, that, that final figure that I presented, that's 115,000 of our Merton residents um, have been fully vaccinated. So I've had both doses of the vaccine and have that, that additional pressure, the additional uh, protection from that vaccination programme. So there's 115,000 of our residents that are fully vaccinated. 15,000 of our residents have had the first dose, so they're awaiting their second dose. Um, so we're making huge strides and inroads into, into those figures, working really, really closely with our community, voluntary sector, and clearly our NHS colleagues. Thank you. Can I just check, of, you said 115,000 double jabbed. Uh, what proportion of the population is that? Um, I'll have to find that figure for you uh, on the slide. One second, please. Thank you. Sorry, 52% I'm told. Thank you, Councillor. Una. Thank you. Um, I just, I, well, firstly, I'd like to say um, that I think we, well, we all know that um, Merton's been very good actually at getting out um, and, and I'd like to commend everybody on, the, on that hard work because I know how much um, people have really been trying to get out to, the, to everybody in the hard to reach groups. And I think we have been quite successful in doing that across the borough. Um, but it, part of that has been really good through the, communi th through the community pop-ups that have been happening. And I just wanted to know whether we were continuing to do that through, th th through the autumn and also and separately, is there any data at all yet on the booster program? Because I know that's obviously and, and going to be quite important coming through, particularly given the tra high transmission of this Delta variant. So thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, my understanding, Councillor, is that yes, we are going to continue that pop up. We're looking at a range of different settings and a range of different sites reflecting the change in target group for the vaccination programme. So, a slightly younger group. So, we are looking at a range of different places, including working in the nighttime economy so we can uh, go to where people are to get that vaccine programme uh, whilst maintaining those larger sites. Uh, and the booster jabs are going to be, as you say, Councillor, incredibly important for us for those high, more vulnerable groups so working with the over 70s residents in care homes health and social care staff so that booster program is due to start very very soon and so we're working on plans with our NHS colleagues to uh, ensure that we deliver that that booster program as effectively as we possibly can 
Helena? Yeah, uh, thanks very much for the presentation. A um, couple of questions from me. I know one of the areas where we have struggled is uptake among younger people. Uh, and I just wondered what, what measures are we putting in place to make sure we get young people having both the first and second dose? And linked to that, um, there has been you know, some concern nationally about large gatherings of young people. And I say this as a young person myself, festivals, uh, other kinds of events. Um, and I'm conscious that this very weekend we have the music festival in Morden Park, um, aimed at a slightly older age group, but nonetheless a large gathering of people, uh, keen to understand how we're approaching that as a borough and the measures that we are putting in place to make sure that people stay safe, both at those events, but also our community stays safe. Are we doing a pop-up lateral flow testing site? Are we trying to get people vaccinated at those events, for example? Um, and then a separate question linked to the stats that you presented more widely on COVID. Um, that on the, the 490 people who have sadly died in the borough, 53 of the 490 people who have died appear to have died at home, which is more than 10%. I find that quite a shocking statistic. Uh, and perhaps it's one really for us as a scrutiny panel to pick up when we do our, our longer piece of work in the work plan around the experiences of COVID-19. But I just, I just found that quite shocking that 10% of people have died at home and, and how could that come about? But perhaps that's one to touch on more when we look back at the learnings from COVID. Thank you, Councillor. Um, and so to, to address that first point about engagement of young people, we're working with our young adult uh, COVID community champions to increase the reach of those messages. So using our comms and engagement functions, we're doing some work with colleagues across London on using TikTok and social media type approaches, but using local people uh, as part of that, though, those key messages. So we're very much engaging uh, young people and that authentic voice to support us with promotion of the vaccine. Um, on the, the second question, which is about the, the events over the weekend. So there are two events on Saturday and Sunday. Um, we're working with uh, the, through the safety advisory group for that event. And we, uh, we within public health team are a member of that. And we've been working on infection prevention control measures as part of this. One of the things that we've asked the organizers to put in place is mandating the fact that people will need to show a COVID pass as part of those ticket responsibilities. So when someone goes to the event, they have to show that they are either double vaccinated or they have had a negative lateral flow test 48 hours before attending the event. So both of those things are going to help reduce the, the risk of COVID-19. Uh, we've seen the communications and the messages that are going out to the ticket holders and they are very clear that you must have one of those two things to be able to access that event. If someone for, for whatever reason isn't able to do so, then the organisers are setting up the facility to people to get tested uh, on site before they enter uh, the, the ticketed area so that if they can then prove negative LFT, then they're able to enter the event. If that LFT would come back positive, then they will not be allowed to attend that event and will be asked to leave the site and return home. So we'd put those measures in place. Um, and on your third point, that third question about the deaths at home, I think it probably is uh, for something about the, the wider learning, perhaps a little bit down the line when we've got a, a little bit more information on those individual deaths. Nigel. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, I, I, would, I, would, um, I would like to um, ask some questions in um, terms of um, death, death rates and um, case, cases of um, this um, time of the um, year. Comparing to a, a year ago, and I've been, uh, been uh, told in the uh, news, uh, apparently the um, death rate um, higher, higher. Is, is, is this um, true in a um, merchant? And um, my, my, my other question is, as we are now um, 
um, giving the um, t- 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 teenagers and young children the um, um, drugs. But, but um, the um, we saw um, um, just were um, come, come along. We are the um, the higher poetry. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I'll address the first question for you. Uh, And we do know that uh, throughout the pandemic, there has been an increase in excess deaths. um, um, And that's been reflected in one of the slides. And you can see the slides that are related to COVID and those that are not. So there has been an increase in those deaths throughout the pandemic that are potentially uh, not related to to the pandemic. Um, And apologies, Councillor, would you mind repeating that question, the second question that you had for me, please? No, no, no uh, way. Um, I, I was um asking uh, about the um Musa um jazz and the um the um kind um t t t t ages or um young um children they are have have been now um, just uh, now and they will probably go on to on um, um this month and probably into um October. My uh, question is: if the the um we the um just um come along, were the um old, older people that the um higher priority? Thank you. Okay, so yes, I think it is going to take a a period of time for us to vaccinate those eligible groups. Um, And so we are focusing at this stage on those 16 to 17 year age groups. But at the same time, we're maintaining to uh, focusing on getting those second jabs and those first vaccinations in all age groups, including those older people within the borough who clearly are at greater risk of severe COVID. So we're kind of uh, working in parallel to target young young people and teenagers, but at the same time, maintaining that focus uh, on uh, uh, all age groups and increasingly looking at the decisions of JCVI which might come in the future about younger age groups but clearly there are no announcements on that but very aware uh, that uh, NHS colleagues are with us tonight but who may wish to add to any of the the kind of answers that I've given this evening. Nigel were you trying to identify whether older people would be given the booster jab before younger people um right that that are you able to answer that barry uh, i can see that mark creelman from the ccg has his hand up chair uh, oh. uh, and apologies chair i don't seem to have the function to raise my hand so i'm having to do it physically so apologies for that um just to say it isn't a, it isn't a case of one being a priority over the other it's it's a simultaneous kind of process for both And just going back to Barry's uh, comments around the booster, the booster programme is already kind of getting up and getting running and actually care homes, we're already beginning to get into care homes while still targeting kind of 15, 16 year olds as well. So it isn't a case of one priority over another, it is both at the same time. Thank you. Are there any other questions from members? Linda. I'm just interested in whether uh, public health are aware, are are there any other variants that we should be concerned about? Thank you, Councillor. Really important question, particularly around the the variants of concern and the variants under investigation. So there are a number, there are four variants of concern that we are looking at from a national level through, through Public Health England and the NHS. And there are a number of VUIs, so variants under investigation, which are closely watched by our uh, NHS colleagues. Um, And so we get regular reports on the VUIs and the VOX. Uh, And at this stage, uh, the almost 100% of the cases that we have are are from that Delta variant. Um, But clearly, we are watching this incredibly closely. Um, and uh, about 10 to 15 percent of all the, P- the positive PCR tests go for sequencing and that's how our surveillance system is able to identify the number of variants under investigation and variants of concern. So as soon as we see anything concerning from that at a national level through those surveillance programs then that raises but at this stage the concern is around that the, the, the very transmissible uh, variants of concern known as Delta. Okay. 
Any more questions? My request is that in east side and south side, there is a difference between the age as well as the facilities. Could you please explain what difference is to the south side is and also when the booster will be available to the older people? Thank you. Okay, so uh, we are delivering in a, in a range of different settings across the borough. We're not just focusing on the east or the west. We're looking at a range of different settings. Um, and perhaps uh, Mark might be able to, to come in and answer that question because he obviously has more up-to-date data than I do on that, that booster program. So, yeah, thanks, Barry. Uh, just to say that we're anticipating that the booster program by the end of September is kind of starting to work through the, the cohorts as the JCBI have set them out with previously. So, again, it's uh, those that are very vulnerable and uh, uh, over 80, and we start then going down the cohorts again. So we do uh, uh, anticipate that it will be really kicking off by the end of September. Um, well, um, if there are uh, no more questions, then we thank uh, our colleagues for uh, the presentation and for answering the questions. Uh, and we'll move on to uh, item five, which is the development of the integrated care system and the implications for Merton. Mark. Okay. Mark. Thank you, Chair. I think um, I think with Mark, Mark Creelman and I are doing a joint effort on this one, are we not, right. Mark? We are. All right. So, so my name's um, Vanessa Ford. I'm the um, Chief Exec for South Hospital of St George's uh, Mental Health Trust. But for tonight, I am also the, or, or I am also the uh, Merton Place-based um, leader. So thank you very much for inviting Mark and I to come along. Um, so we've got a, a, a short slide deck to, uh, to talk you through, um, and we'll do a bit of a double act on it. So what is the ICS? The integrated care system is made up of three parts. So we have um, our, our ICS at a Southwest London system level, the integrated care system at place level, and an integrated care system at provider collaborative level. And the way that I best understand it is that the place is obviously for us, it's Merton, Provider collaboratives are the highly specialised end of treatment. So, for example, for mental health care, that would be the um, inpatient um, care provision um, rather than the community care provision that is provided at place. And then um, we have system wide decision making. So if you go on to the next slide. Um, so key updates as to where we are. Uh, so place transition teams are now in place. Um, provider collaborate, collaborative forms. We have two in South West London, the Acute Provider Collaborative and the South London Partnership, which takes in board all of the mental health services. A functional review of um, the CCG is, has been pretty much completed now and conversations are in place with partners um, and we're engaging um, uh, proactively on that. Um, are, um, we've commenced the listening exercise, um, uh, which um, I'll talk, touch base on in, in a moment. I think the rest of it you could probably read. I don't think there's anything there that I need to draw out. But the main theme is that by, by April 2022, we will hope to be um, uh, moved into the new ICS um, arrangements. We can go on to the next slide. So what does that, oh, what does that mean for uh, transition? What the places have to do? So we have four key roles to carry out at Merton Place to support and develop primary care networks, to simplify, um, to simplify modernize and join up health and care, um, and to understand the needs of our local population and the population health management, and to coordinate the local contribution to health, social and economic development. So uh, what we what is absolutely critical to that is the full involvement of all partners and I'm really pleased with the way in which Merton Merton already had great partnership working in place so we had a really strong and firm foundation to build on I think hearing the presentation earlier this evening 
from Barry just about how partners work together in response to COVID, particularly the third and voluntary sector is something that we should all be really proud of. And our responsibility as a place transition team is to build on that um, even, 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 even more really. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so uh, we have um, a, a requirement to, to, to kind of build on the, um, I, the existing health and social care, the, the local health and care plans to develop our six, 12 and 18 month programmes to set very clear expected outcomes and very clear actions that we want to take. Um, and we engage in a group which is called Strengthening Communities Programme Group which brings together um, uh, all aspects of, of the community programmes, so, so social care um, and health care together. If we go on to the next slide. So um, in Merton, you, you would kind of say it was early days, um, but, um, but actually it's kind of building on existing days rather than the new days. So um, in the transition team, there were kind of, there were mandated roles. So we had to have local authority appropriately. So we had to have, um, and social care, we had to have um, uh, the key providers of um, healthcare, but we also extended that to ensure that we had Simon uh, representing the third and voluntary sector and also Dagmar uh, representing public health because we recognise that that was absolutely essential in the delivery of the response to COVID and would be very um, important going forward. Uh, we've had um, a, a number of meetings so far uh, where we have formed the team um, but also thought through the um, requirements uh, to review the uh, health and care plan. Um, and we've held a number of workshops connected. So we've had really, really good engagement um, from all different types of people, um, uh, people, local residents, right the way through to our, our staff and, um, our, um, and, and other key leaders with, across the system. Um, we've uh, also looked at the organisational needs for the partners. We've recruited a programme director um, and the rest of it, I think you can probably read through your packs. Uh, but the, what, what I've noted at the bottom, the three primary care network development sessions are fundamental because one of the things that's really important in order to um, ensure that place succeeds is that we have really effective uh, working arrangements across our primary care into our community and social care networks. If we go on to the next Listen, slide. Can I just oh, jump in? You, got, you jump in. And just around the, the, the workshops that we've been doing around the Mountain Health and yeah. Care Plan. And it's just to say that we're not re-rating the plan. The plan was already written and there was a lot of really great engagement work that went into that. So what we're doing is we're kind of refreshing that. Sorry, we're, we're, uh, we're struggling in the council chamber to hear both of you I think uh, but particularly uh, Mark and uh, if you, I don't know if you can turn the volume up or get closer to the microphone please. Is that any better? Any better? Yes. yes. Okay so I'm leaning forward I'll um, so it's just to say that with the Mountain Health and Care Plan we already had a plan and we're not rewriting it from scratch we're building on the really fantastic engagement that was already done across all our organizations and actually uh, reviewing it and refreshing it through the kind of post covid lens and also with the lens of inequalities because covid you know threw up a lot uh, kind of exacerbated a lot of the inequalities that we already knew about in merton and we want to make sure that we're can in putting that into the new plan. So it's just to say we're building on the past rather than rewriting it. Back to you, Vanessa. Thank you, Mark. Appropriately, um, appropriately adjusted. Thank you for that. Um, so this is a mugshot of who we are. As you can see, John is part of our uh, transition team and a central part of our transition team. So there's uh, myself, John, Simon, Alison, who um, leads for CLCH, our community provider, Suzanne, who works at St George's Hospital, Jen, who's our new programme um, direct, uh, program director, Sai, who's one of our local GPs, and, uh, and Dagmar, who I'm sure you all um, know and have met previously. But we, we, we form the team. And then if we can go on to the next slide, uh, which is just background. 
So recognising that there's probably quite a bit of NHS uh, bureaucratic language in there, and there may well be some questions about what, what differences it's going to make. Um, but I think the most important thing is that we build, that I would want to leave you on, is that we're building on existing relationships um, with a firm commitment to work very closely with, um, with, with the council and everyone in this room. If there are any questions, I'm, my, either myself or Mark will be happy to take them. Thank you. Are there any questions? Helena. Yeah, thanks both of you for the presentation and, and for the slides that you shared as a pre-read. Um, I have to admit, I am struggling a little bit to understand exactly what this means for our residents and what, what the difference will be, if any, for them on, on the ground. Is there a way that you could explain this in a, in a kind of simple way that I could explain it to one of my residents, what these changes are and what change it will mean for them, if any? That's a very good question. So I shall have I shall have a first bite of the cherry, Mark, and then you can um, you can have you can have second. So the way that I would understand it is that if if the um, integrated care system works effectively, all the different aspects of health should be able to come together so that you when you go to the GP, it doesn't matter who provides the service. It's a seamless transition into that care, and the, and the, the money and investment follows the needs of the local health population but but mark you have your second bite uh, so um I, again a really good question i think what we need to remember and i hope you can hear me is that, is that for an integrated care system it's about improving outcomes for our residents and tackling those inequalities but also doing it in a kind of productive and value for money way um a, uh, there is something around the governance of integrated care systems that I just want to touch upon. And actually, there will be an integrated care partnership, which is a really broad partnership across southwest London between health, local authorities, voluntary sector. Um, and th that is jointly convened between health and uh, the local authority. And so there are two boards. There's a partnership board and then there's an NHS board. And I'm getting into NHS speak. But I think the reality is, is that what we're trying to do is basically join up services so that they are seamless for our residents. And actually, at any point of access and point of contact, um, our residents can uh, expect a full range of services based on need and based on criteria. Did that answer your question, Helena? Yes, it did. It did. Thank you. And I think that's a, a good way of putting it. And perhaps... You know, in future, when we when we do pre-reads, we could just start with that really simple, clear explanation that, that our residents would understand and then dive into the detail and the jargon. Linda. Where does social care fit into all of this? Shall I, shall I start, Vanessa? Yes, yes please. Uh, so social care are kind of the uh, uh, key, key partner. So in all of this, as we um, uh, at the South West London level, the care partnership will be kind of jointly convened by local authorities and health. But at a local level, social care is actually round the table and round uh, the discussions around anything that's delegated around budgets, et cetera, et cetera. So absolutely key partner in the development of services and the, uh, the implementation of services. John, may want to further question: Has the CCG been demoted? So I'll, I'll take that one as I'm the only CCG member. Is the CCG will cease to exist as of the 31st of March? They are still going through Parliament, but I think we can say it's already had its second reading. Um, so we are anticipating that the integrated care system will be live as of the 1st of April, and the CCG will stop existing on the 31st of March a waste of time and energy. I spent an enormous amount of my time when I was cabinet member for adult social care and health working with our local CCG here to get them competent. We disconnected from Sutton, so we had our own, and a hell of a load of work went into that, and now it's all gone. It's such a nonsense. Can I, can I come in, Councillor? Uh, um, Councillor McCabe, can I come in? Go ahead, John. Oh, sorry. So it, they are very good questions. 
the, the formation of the ICS really is another NHS restructure. So Mark has said from the 31st of March, we're not going to have Merton Wandsworth CCG, it's going to be the six CCGs will be coming together. But the place, which is Merton, that's where I'm interested. And I think adult social care and the local authority have a huge role to play at that. We have an opportunity to do things differently, to work in a much more integrated way. The last 18 months of the pandemic has shown us one thing, when we work together and work together really well and really closely, we can get things done. Health could not have managed without adult social care and the local authority during the last eight months of the pandemic. They couldn't have managed without adult social care or hospital discharges and all of the work we do on the ground. They couldn't have managed without the public health, but we couldn't have managed without them. And as working together as one system, we have achieved a lot more for the residents of Merton. So working a place, there is the opportunity that we'll be able to work better together in a more integrated way. Yeah, could I just could I just add that also I think Vanessa in the presentation mentioned the functional review. So actually all the CCG functions. Sorry, you're fading. Uh, out again, we need to... Sorry, all CCG functions have been part of that functional review and many of those will still sit at place and many of those will uh, also go to the South West London ICS. So all the work that was done around CCGs and the really great functions that have been developed will be retained, but will be developed and delivered just in a slightly different way. So I just wanted to kind of assure that, that we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're taking the good stuff from CCGs and, and taking it with us into the ICS, the integrated care system, sorry. Do you want to come back on that? Okay. Can I just, uh, following on from uh, Linda's question, and I've seen other members that want to ask uh, a question, is how many times has uh, the health service been reorganised over the last few years? And when is this permanent revolution going to stop? And how much money is this costing? And how do people, how are people expected to get on with their jobs of delivering healthcare when they're no sooner put into one structure and organization than some bright spark comes up with a, a new way of restructuring the health service? Now, I, I guess that's a difficult question for. Um, the employees of the NHS to to, uh, to answer, um, but I, I think I'll throw it out there as a as a rhetorical question, uh, as much as anything else. But if you'd like to comment, then feel free to do so. Uh, Vanessa, shall I take that one? You're um, very welcome to. I was going to comment, but you carry on, Mark, and then I'll come back. I'll come on the back. So I, do, I, I, I mean, this is this is national policy, so it's not set at a local level. So I, I do take the comments about change on board. Um, I do think that uh, when we are talking about services and the integration of services, that is something that has been on the agenda for a very long time. And what we don't want to do is we don't want people to bounce between social care and health services and voluntary sector. And the integration of our services is really important. Now, I, under, I, I do get that, you know, we're doing this on a, a, another change programme, but I think the outcome of, of trying to achieve tackling inequalities, better outcomes for patients is a, is, a, is a principle that we've all been working to for a long time. So I take on board the constant change. It is a national policy, but I do think integrated services is, is a bonus for, uh, is a benefit for us all. Thank you. Una. What role will you have in terms of property? Linda, I just invited Una. Sorry. Oh. Sorry, I didn't see you, John. I need eyes in the back of my head. Thank you, Una. John. Councillor McCabe, it was a really good question. 
Um, in, in my view, there's been a slight missed opportunity. Um, we've been waiting for the, the, the reforms of adult social care for the last number of years, and they keep being delayed. It would have been a better proposition if we'd had the health and care bill and the reforms of adult social care that come at the same time and we were able to do more integrated work together. But as Mark has said, working as an integrated system is the right thing to do. We still have a system that district nurses could go into a house and my social workers or occupational therapists go into a house and our systems don't speak together. So as Vanessa was saying, having a digital solution to that is, is one of the things we're working towards. And that's the right thing to do, that our, our staff on the ground are able to share records, are able to work better together. So um, it is uh, another reform. It will be complicated because we'll soon have the restructure of public health, plus we'll have more work on the reform of adult social care. So there are more changes coming down the line as well um, with or after the health and care bill. But as Mark said, working together as one system is the right thing to do. John, I don't think anyone doubts that. Um, but I have to say that what you've just said is something I've heard every time the health, the NHS has been reorganised, that this will lead to joined up thinking, joined up working and, you know, and, and when you've heard it for the third or fourth time, you start to uh, tire of it because what we actually want to see is improved adult social care, improved health care, uh, and it just seems such a waste to be constantly uh, reorganising and restructuring. Um, and I, I think I've, I've laboured that point, I've had my say, uh, and I'll invite Una to ask her a question now. Thank you, Chair. I think we can all agree that having a better integrated system and better adult social care and better outcomes from those would, would all be great. But I, I can't help but agree that trying to dovetail that, that, that together, the better, you know, the bill with, with, with the system probably would be better, but at least we're getting somewhere with, with one thing. So hopefully. My question though is actually, I, I, it's just a clarification here, I think. Um, uh, and I think it was, it's been highlighted that the program director has been recruited. It says in the note, program director recruited CCG and provider resource. But when I looked at, when you look at the list of people on the, I, mean, I, I understand this is the transition team. So that person isn't listed. I, I just wondered, is, is, so, so is this transition team going into where they'll be the program director? And are we not able to know who that person is yet, albeit that they've been recruited? Or is this somebody that's, um, you know, one of the lovely folk that are being highlighted there is one of those like Vanessa or somebody, the actual director. I just wondered, thank you. So, so, so the program director for, for, for the Merton Place is Jen Goddard. So she, she is- Sorry, could you speak up? Sorry, uh, Jen Goddard, who is on the, uh, the, the picture there, um, is the program director, but she's there to support the development of the transition and the development of place. So she's not the overall director of Merton Place, she's the program director for the pieces of work that we've identified to get us to an integrated care system. So uh, I hope that clarifies, clarifies it for, for Councillor Moulton. Do, 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 you, do you have the name of the programme director? It's Jen the programme director is Jen Goddard. Right. But the place leader, who is, it has overall responsibility for the place, is Vanessa Ford. Right. Thank you. Linda. Um, I'm just interested to know what your role will be around property. And, and I'm you... particularly concerned about the lack of um, movement on Wilson. Okay, so in terms of uh, the estates function, the estates function will transfer to the ICS um, with specific uh, reference to kind of the East, the East Merton. 
Uh, we have now had confirmation that uh, there is funding available through NHS Property Services and the CCG has identified that there was a small gap that it could cover in terms of the funding. So when we are progressing that to the next stage, which is a full business case. Um, so I hope that firstly assures that estates will stay within the NHS and within the ICS, um, and we are progressing with the, uh, the, the East Merton model of health and well-being uh, known as the Wilson. But will you be actually dealing with them directly or will you have various things to go through? Uh, so, so it will remain pretty much, I think, the same as it is now. Uh, we will have a relationship with NHS property services, um, uh, but actually the states uh, and strategy, et cetera, will sit with the ICS, the integrated care system. So that will still be at a local level. Is there going to be a reduction in um, funding available? Um, you're, you're looking at six authorities coming together. That's the whole purpose of this to uh, cut down on the cost. Uh, so I think the principle is to actually try to develop systems that are truly integrated. Um, uh, uh, in terms of we haven't been asked at this point to save money or uh, make efficiencies at this point, but I think after COVID, there's probably a, a financial challenge for us all uh, in every organisation. But the principle of this is around integrated care and integrated systems rather than saving money. Any other questions? Okay, I've got uh, one or two, if I may. Um, uh, on under place, uh, you've identified four main roles, um, and number two uh, on that is to simplify, modernise, and join up health and care. So, what are the implications for the finances and the budgets? of health and care? I think that's a really important question for all of us. Uh, my second question is on the same slide, um, under the, uh, on the, uh, towards the end, the second bullet point, um, um, important links with other public and voluntary services, uh, such as improving local skills or employment, or by ensuring high quality housing. Can somebody explain to me how you're going to ensure high quality housing? Because I spend a great deal of my time trying to um, persuade housing authorities to do basic uh, work within our community for people who are living in very poor housing conditions. And um, if there is some kind of magic bullet uh, that you have found, I'd be very keen if you could share it with us. Uh, and then um, my final question is, um, I, I think, you know, that the team that you have um, described, the transition team, are clearly uh, a very talented uh, bunch of people. But uh, those that I know are, are also uh, extremely busy and hard pressed. So my question is, is how are all of these people expected to do their day jobs, uh, particularly in the current uh, circumstances and get on with this major piece of work? And what are the um, opportunity costs of this? Should we take your questions in reverse? Um, I'm not sure any of them are, are necessarily particularly easy ones, um, but then, then, but that's that's not necessarily a bad thing. So um, my so let's so I do think we have we're really lucky in Merton. We've got some really good leaders um, who all have um, full time jobs to do, uh, and at the same time, our responsibility as senior leaders in healthcare and social care is to lead within the boroughs that we are uh, that we are responsible to. So actually, if we can make these, if we can make the structure effective, um, it should ensure that our partnership working and relationships are effective, which means that we can deliver things more easily and swiftly for the residents of Merton. Albeit, I know that you will have been told that any number of times before. 
But I'm aware that John, you just put your you put your hand up as I was speaking. So do you want to come in? Wait for Mark first, because I think Mark wanted to come in, then I'll come in at the end if that's okay. So, so uh, just in terms of, you're, you're absolutely right. These are very busy people with very busy day jobs running organizations, but actually there is also the CCG staffing resource to support them in the, some of the transition work. And actually, as we move through the transition work, we should, you know, the day job should become about the integrated system. And so actually one lends itself to the other. So I think uh, you're absolutely right. We've got a very talented group um, they are very busy, hence us putting the programme director, Jen Goddard, in to support the work. But also we can call upon CCG staffing resource to help with particular projects and programmes of work. John? Oh, well, it, it was a very good question, Councillor McCabe, about housing, about the other uh, detriments to health. Um, and there isn't a magic bullet to, to, to fix housing as, as you actually answered the question. One of the really interesting things about the health and care bill is the, the, the shift towards prevention. It's the first time that I've ever heard health really focus on prevention. As we will know um, from all the years that we've worked in health and social care, often in the council and in the CCG, the things that get cut first are those preventative uh, things that are further down the tracks. There is now going to be a much more greater focus on prevention, preventing the need, preventing someone, keeping them well in their health well, tackling obesity, tackling frailty, tackling ill health, so that someone doesn't have um, those long-term needs. So. I think that's one of the great opportunities that we have with the ICS is to tackle uh, inequalities. Housing, uh, so tackle inequalities and the other detriments to health, which could include housing. But I've got to be honest, I think that one's maybe further down the tracks than, than we'll be able to address very quickly. And, 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 and if I could just jump in there and just uh, add that, you know, I think the, the the, the statute is about seeing things beyond health and the things that have an impact on health. And we know that ha poor housing is one of those impacts. Um, and if I just give an example, so recently um, St. George's run, St. George's Hospital run uh, an apprenticeship scheme. And they have said to us, well, actually, why don't we make that scheme available to care leavers? within Merton, and that's the kind of developments that we want to see. So where health can identify some real impacts across other parts of the system and vice versa. And I think that's quite a good example of kind of how we want to extend into other areas. But that said, there isn't a magic bullet, and I know that having, having worked in the health and social care for 25 years. Then the final one in reverse order is, um, how does this work in terms of finances and budgets? So Vanessa, shall I start again and, and you can jump in? Uh, so the work at the moment, our finance colleagues are uh, looking at those budgets that would be held at the acute collaboratives um, that would be held at a Southwest London level and those budgets that would be delegated down to to place. And those budgets, it is written in the kind of the, the guidance, it's around primary care, uh, community services, community mental health, voluntary sector, and that those budgets will sit at place for the partnership at place to really decide how best to spend them. Um, the key thing I think to say is at the moment those budgets are being dealt done and, and that piece of work is being done on existing budgets. So it will depend on our allocation on an annual basis, but actually at the moment, the work is looking at the current budgets that we have and how they are delegated going forward. So uh, there isn't a financial ask at the moment to make an efficiency saving. I'm not saying that won't be the future, but certainly at the moment, it's on current budgets that we are looking at, uh, at the new system. So what I was driving at is who makes the decisions about how the cake is divided up. So certainly at a place level, 
the partnership that um, we have talked about in terms of representatives of health, the voluntary sector, social care, local authority, public health, those partners will have a delegated budget in which to kind of prioritise the, the spend uh, across particular areas, you know, uh, and that will be the, the strength of the kind of partnership committee, I think. Just a, a question linked to that. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody would would disagree with with John's suggestion that we should focus on prevention as well as treatment. But nothing that I'm seeing in in the answers so far suggests a greater budget available. So, if we have this this new focus on prevention that we didn't have before, does that mean we're therefore diverting funds from frontline services? or if, if there are, you know, because there aren't additional funds. So I'm struggling to see how you pivot towards prevention without an increase in funds. So shall I, shall I answer that, uh, Vanessa and, and John? So I think it's about ensuring that the money that we do have available to us is prioritised and spent wisely across the partnership. So it is about the partnership coming together to really prioritise where that money is spent. I don't think there are is a lot of new money. There are different pots of money which we can apply for uh, throughout, uh, throughout the time in the NHS. But I, I do think it is about prioritising and really galvanising how we spend the money to make sure that we're getting as much value and as much impact on our, our for our population as possible i mean vanessa might want to come in or indeed join yeah. so i think i think mark you've, you've 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 summarized some of it but i think it is about how we use the population health data most effectively to direct resources um from from the existing envelope because i think we've got to be realistic we haven't got an expanded envelope um so it, it will be about how we direct it for the for the population of Merton, rather than um, a, 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 that, that's reflective of the current population health needs. But John, do you want to come in on the back of that? Another very good question. And I'll give a little example of some of the things that we're doing to tackle inequalities. So we're, we're, we're using our population health data and we're targeting frailty in two of the localities in Merton. And I think it's it's both of them are in East Merton because that's the, the highest instance of frailty. And it is working as a system, galvanizing our resources and working together to tackle inequality. And we're looking at small seeded projects and so two of the PCMs. And it is around um, frailty, getting people fitter, trying to, to, to work with the people with the greatest need as a system to tar tackle a major problem for the system, which is frailty. And we're starting to look at those things across the borough as a system and doing it together. I often speak to Vanessa about the fact that in Vanessa's service, she has an employment team. I have an employment team. Um, children's have an employment team through the schools. Mark's just spoken about it in George's. Uh, um, um, they're using the resources about care leavers. We could do something together, something not with more resources, not with extra resources, but doing things together in a much more coordinated way. And that could have a bigger and better impact for our residents. And sorry, Councillor McCabe, I would just add that the other thing that I think is, is what we have seen through COVID is the power of the voluntary sector, haven't we? Mm. And actually, they will be round the table having those conversations about how to prioritise finances and what they can contribute and actually, you know, how they will be funded going forward as well. So I think that's a really exciting development in the integrated care system. Can I say we've been doing that with the voluntary sector for years? I just, it just seems like why hasn't it been taken up before? Mark, it might be a good idea to speak about social prescribing and the impact of social prescribing, Merton being the pilot and the impact social prescribing has had on them, on the system. Yeah, so we, uh, we've got social prescribers who basically navigate 
uh, people for, uh, away from kind of the, you know, uh, the more traditional health services and into community services and voluntary sector services that will support them based on their needs. And we did a, a survey recently that said people that had been going uh, through the social prescribing service actually then went back to their GP 23% less than others who didn't go through the service. So actually what we were seeing is actually people really getting the support they needed from voluntary and community organisations rather than from traditional health services. We also did a survey just on in terms of the impact it had on their life um, and 26% uh, reported that it had enhanced their life and their skills in a very positive way. So I think we've got some uh, we've got some examples really of where we have come together and been able to use uh, work with our voluntary sector colleagues in a really positive way. I think the integrated care systems, I think you're absolutely right, councillor. Merton have been doing this uh, for a long time and have a very thriving community and voluntary sector. I think the integration is that we will do this once with them rather than multiple times and actually really make them part and parcel of care pathways and also of the system pathways. Okay, well, I think we've given this um, a good uh, start uh, in terms of the scrutiny of this development. Clearly, this is something that uh, as you go forward uh, on this journey, we'll be uh, returning to. And um, I've no doubt members uh, of this uh, panel will have lots of questions for you, but we do wish you well, um, and we want you to succeed. And, you know, it, it is music to my ears when I hear uh, people talking about health inequalities, but I, I have to say that there's, there's some irony in the prioritization of inequalities uh, when we've recently made a decision to move a hospital away from the most deprived parts of our borough uh, into uh, the most affluent part of, of um, leafy Surrey. Uh, and given the uh, recent um, uh, announcements that there may be some threat to the funding of that, uh, then I hope that uh, NHS colleagues might um, see that it would be consistent to look again at that decision. Uh, and that would really convince me uh, that there was a, a true desire to address the unacceptable issue of health inequalities uh, in our place, which is Merton. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, the... Uh, next item is cabinet member priorities. Um, I haven't spoken to the cabinet member. Um, right. Well, um, we we can defer. I mean, you know, that's that's not a problem, uh, and we look forward to welcoming the cabinet member uh, when she uh, is available. So we move on then to item seven, uh, which is the work program. Um, are you going to introduce this? Page 15. Okay. So this is the, um, this report just sets out the draft work program for this municipal year. Traditionally, you would have agreed the work program at the last meeting, but as you know, it was deferred. Um, and it's accumulation of the suggestions that came forward from our topic selection process, where we asked members of the community to put forward ideas um, we spoke internally to colleagues, we asked councillors 
um, to come up with suggestions. And we had a topic workshop back in June where a long list of sub subjects were discussed by panel members. And um, you then worked by email to prioritize the list. And that is the work program that is attached. So you're asked to comment and agree the work program this evening, and also to suggest if there is a topic that you would like to look at in more depth as a task group review. Um, are there any comments? Helena. Thank you, Stella. Um, a few points from me. Um, firstly, on, on the, the list of topics that we have in Appendix 1, the work plan for each meeting doesn't seem to correlate. So for example, we have COVID-19, understanding residents' experiences of services, and then care homes, maternity services, and hospital admissions. But on the work plan, all I could see was the usual standing agenda item, impact of COVID-19 in, in Merton. There didn't seem to be, for example, one on care homes, one on maternity services. Perhaps that's to come, but just wanted to make sure that we don't miss that detail. No, these are the topic suggestions, I think. And then it correlates to the table on page 26 onwards, and that's the meeting dates underneath. Thank you, Councillor. Just to say that those points will be integrated into the updates from the Director of Public Health on one hand, and also there will be some updates from the CCG in November which okay. looks at some of the COVID issues that you asked for, but they, they definitely have been taken into consideration and you will get the reports that you've asked for. Great, and if, if the Director of Public Health is the person best placed to do that, then that's fine. I just want to make sure that we're hearing from the people closest to these experiences and, and we should invite others if we need to draw on a wider range of, of learnings. Um, and then on the standard agenda items and I did I did send this over several times so perhaps the, the detail is still being missed but we've got standard agenda items immunization schedule colon and then there's a list of screenings which is something slightly different what I had suggested that we look at as a panel is two things firstly the routine immunization schedules so that is largely childhood immunizations and how those are keeping up particularly during the pandemic and when you know the health system has been under strain have we got any issues with the routine childhood immunizations and secondly doing the same for the routine health screenings so the diabetic eye screening breast cancer i would add to not just breast cancer but also bowel cancer cervical cancer as well the three main screenings the flu jab um, for the over 65s and other vulnerable groups so i just think we've conflated their immunizations and health screenings but it is important to have all of that detail. And I see on the um, schedule, it's, it's penciled in for February, 2022, which I would, I would suggest is too, it's very far into the future. I think it'd be very good to have an update on that at the next meeting, uh, mindful of the impact that COVID-19 may have had on those screening and immunization rates. Thank you, Councillor Chair, is it okay if I respond? Um, given the, um, the pandemic and the impact on health partners, this year I took the liberty of asking our health colleagues when would be the best time for them to report to scrutiny, given the pressures on their workloads. And um, having some conversations with NHS England, that they asked particularly if they could report in February. And so that's why it's, it's, it's on the work programme for that time. I can go back and ask if they can bring it forward. But as you know, they've been under, along with other departments, they've been under a lot of pressure. Um, Councillor, thank you for raising your point about um, looking at children's immunizations. Um, as I've raised with you, this topic is particularly, is usually looked at by the children and young people's panel. Um, we could, there's a number of ways that you could take, if the panel wants to look at that issue, then the chair would need to raise this with the chair of the other panel. We don't want to, I'm sure you don't want to duplicate um, work. Um, maybe you can look at ways to have a joint session or um, whatever other ways that you suggest that we could take it forward. But it is traditional. I think, I think there was a, a conversation 
offline about this and, and both cabinet members said they were very happy for our committee to look at it. If it also needs to go through the chair of, of the relevant committees, we can. Uh, as a courtesy, I think we should talk to the chair of the other panel um, and um, I, will, I will do that um, I'm, and, and talk to the cabinet members concerned and see where we can get to with this. But I, I think the point is well made that you know we don't have unlimited resources and we can't be duplicating work that is being done uh, in other parts of the council by other panels so I'll, I'll, I'll have that chat. And I suggest on, on the timing that we at least get some data before then even if we, we can't have someone come and present if we could have a report on the data which will already exist in the system I don't think that would be a a workload burden for colleagues in the NHS. I'm just, I'm, I'm very concerned that, you know, we, we already know that there were issues in the borough with particular rates of childhood immunizations, MMR, for example, and the disruption that we've had to the local health service, the closure of schools. This could all have had a further negative impact. And, and while we do need to balance that with the other workloads, you know, the last thing we want as a borough is, is another outbreak of a disease because vaccination rates have slipped. So I think it's important we look at we look at these soon. And then Chair, I had one more suggestion, which we don't have on the work plan because when we were discussing it, it hadn't been announced by the, the local NHS, but there is a consultation at present on moving uh, renal services, kidney services from St. Helier to St. George's. Um, and I suggest we, we look at that as a scrutiny panel. Chair, um, I'm happy to take that forward just to say that that particular item has been looked at at the South West London Joint Health Scrutiny Committee. But if you want to have a local um, scrutiny on it, then, that, then I can ask for that to come. I think we've often said that as, uh, if, if South West London want to look at something, that's fine, but we reserve the right to look at something that affects our community um, here and um, I, th I think that's an important issue for the people of Merton and I would support that proposal. Linda. Yeah, a couple of things really. One, one is about the format for a task group. Second one is about obesity, which we haven't um, got on any agenda, which is obviously a really huge issue. Um, but on, in terms of the task force issue, um, one, so who agrees the terms of reference for, for a task group? Is it the panel? So... Agree the task uh, and we ask officers to draft a, um, a terms of reference and then we agree them. That's my understanding of how it works. Okay. And then if a group of people on the, uh, the scrutiny panel decide that they would like to be part of that task group, do we require to have an officer as part of that? Can we do it on our own? That's what I'm saying. There are um, we, we've got a number of models for task group reviews. We do, the scrutiny team has resource and do offer support to task groups, but we also have a model called a rapporteur model where an individual counsellor can conduct a review with, with the agreement of the panel, an individual counsellor can do a review on their own and bring it back to the panel um, after they've done their own research and gathered evidence and written a report. But we do have resource to support one review per municipal year. Can I just ask a question about, the, it's the title Healthier Communities, so it should bring in children. So it, is anything that is to do with children, do, do we always have to refer in? Because we are dealing with overall health, aren't we, of the community? I think there is clearly an overlap. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, health is our responsibility, children is their responsibility which side of that line do certain issues fall must be something that we need to sit down and discuss and work out. If we were looking at children's weights in schools, 
Um, if we if we were asking our local schools to be monitoring children's weight so that we had a, an idea of, of how many children were overweight and then what programs are in place for them to to be dealing with the issue. Um, I, I mean, I have no idea what's going on, or, uh, whether all schools are conforming with this or not. But would that be something that we I know it's not on this list, but is that the sort of thing that we could actually get involved in where we would be asking information from uh through education well, i would have thought that, that would fall on the line of children's services rather than because we would require the cooperation right. of schools to to undertake such uh, an exercise and um i think that would 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 fall to them but it, you're right it's not on the list so it's a bit of a hypothetical question we've got plenty on our list yeah. to to do and yeah. consider so do you mind if I if I kind of I mean you know uh, Helena has made some points. Do a task group or well, you form a task group. I mean, we normally do a task group and then other councillors can join. So so, so effectively, um, if there was a, a a task group formed on say something like obesity or immunisations, which are, are more general. You can do, you can invite, well, obviously people can come from finance, but equally from people that are normally involved on the children's side could be attending those or vice versa. So, um, so, so if someone has an, in, you know, an interest in it, you can do collaborative work with a task group. I mean, that's what I think I've always found very interesting on task groups, to be honest with you. Historically, I've had more of an interest on the, on the children, um, but uh, you know, I, I'm on health and well-being board. I, I look at I look at all those issues because I think it's really important. And I certainly take on board what you were saying about immunisations. And certainly, when I was on the children, well, that was one of the things I was always hot on was where where are we on the immunisation scale? And, and and things like obesity clearly crossover because that's where it can all start. So, yeah, we're all interested in prevention. I think sitting here. So. That's that's how I would do it. Is that we we, we you know if we we had an interest on something that then you can invite other councillors through. Yeah. That may help us to identify the things that we want to do. A, a, a you know sort of a, a, way of doing it. a, a, a group um, exercise on. So um, we've got to keep the the room ventilated, but that does leave us open to motorcycles going by um so uh the, we've we've considered the work program um and we've there's a couple of things that we've agreed to do one of which is that i will talk to the chair of um children's schools is it children's schools and families that uh, no right the, the appropriate panel um and the other thing is you will liaise with health colleagues, Stella, and see what possibilities there may be of bringing that item that Helen has um, asked could be brought forward. If, if it can be done, um, then that's something that we'd like to see. But we recognise that, uh, as you say, um, colleagues have been under a great deal of pressure and it simply may not be possible with the best will in the world, but we will ask the question uh, and that will decide what we're, and that may result in some changes because we might bring that forward and put something back um, in order to sort of compensate. So is that agreed? Okay. Um, and then um, we need, I think the next thing we should do is agree an issue for scrutiny by a task group. Are there any suggestions for that? We have been. Yeah.
I think these are the those are the suggestions for the work plan for the 21-22. Yeah, and I'm looking for proposals for what we should do for a, um, a, a task group. Well, I think it may well come from the list that's in front of us. So, like people may may say, this is something that we'd like a particular, particularly detailed look at, and and so I'm looking for suggestions. I think childhood immunizations could be one, but it it's very hard to say without seeing the initial data. Um. In the last municipal year, it was found that rates were particularly low in Merton, and it was flagged as a cause of concern before the pandemic. And so members, you were considering as a panel to look at that in more detail Then the pa pandemic hit and everything was, um, was obviously thrown out of the window, but I, it's something that, that it has been of interest. So you might wish to take that forward, but I understand Councillor Donnelly, you want to look at the data. So maybe I can sort of work with you to try and look at some of those issues and then come back to the panel. Information. Um, well, the next meeting, how about if we try to bring something to the next meeting, Chair? Great. Okay, let's do that. Is that something that meets the approval of this panel? I, th I think it might. It, it, like I said, it's hard to say without seeing initial data, but it may make sense to do a deeper dive into both immunisations and the routine screenings. If that has lapsed, particularly during COVID, and we need to we need to get that back up to the levels it should be. Um, but I, I think it's a good suggestion. I think we we just we need a sense of where we are before we decide to do a a deeper dive. I would suggest. Okay. Are people happy with that? And are you going to be able to get that information for? Uh, you've got the time, Stella. Speak to Councillor Dollymore. Um, okay. And we can present something to the next meeting. Okay. Right. And um, so the the method by which the panel would like to scrutinise. Um, I mean, I think we'd do a, um, a sort of a usual practice um, unless somebody's got some, uh, there is a particular issue or topic that might require us to, to do things in a slightly different way, but we can kind of work that out as we go along. Um, and then the final thing is to identify any training and support needs. How do we how do we do that? Chair, if there's a particular area that the panel feels that they would like some training and support, right. then I'll have to work with member services to see what what options are available. But I think the problem here is that we've got a range of councillors um, with different kind of service on different panels and committees and different lengths of time on the council with different uh, expertise from their own uh, areas of, of work or life or uh, life experience and, and so it's very difficult to come up with a kind of one size fits all so is there a mechanism by which we could uh, I mean, isn't that part of the process of councillor training anyway that people are asked to identify their own individual needs is this on top of no, so we haven't had any suggestions put forward, but we just okay. Obviously, this is another forum to discuss it. Yeah. 
Right. Okay. Well, this is an opportunity for people to holler if they have a particular training need that they don't think is being met. Um, so this is your chance. Speak now or not forever hold your peace, but, um, you know, because there will be other opportunities. But are there any burning issues that people want to raise in terms of their own training? Okay. Well, in that case... Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, I think she's pretty good at accessing what she needs anyway. So, um, um, okay. We've, we've, we've dealt with all the recommendations. Is there anything else that we need to do, Stella? Okay. Well, in that case, can I, oh, Nigel, just as I was about to, Dismiss the class. Your thank you, um, sure. Is it, is it possible? I mean, can I bring forward um today's um um uh, 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 item six to the uh, next meeting, please? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.